makes a camel beautiful? Two out of four disqualified from a Saudi camel festival in 2018 for Botox injections in one of several such scandals. The festival has continued on and seventh edition began last Thursday. The annual King Abdul Aziz Camel Festival, among the region's largest, is set to last 45 days. Thousands of camels participate each year, and their owners show off in 75 competitions this time around. The prizes total 100 million Saudi riyals, or about 26 million dollars. 33,000 camels descended to the area north of Riyadh last year, from as far as France, UK, Russia and the US. The domestic population of camels is estimated at 1.4 million. Jurors look especially at the shape of a camel's head, neck and humps, as well as its posture. Cosmetic enhancements are indeed strictly prohibited, but scandals have occurred. The 2018 affair was eclipsed by one in 2021, when more than 40 camels had to be disqualified. The breeders took the animals through various forms of facelifting, in that, for example, stretching out their ribs and noses by hand or collagen slash botox injections. They would give the animals hormones to make their muscles look bigger. And if not that, they would use rubber bands for that purpose, restricting blood circulation. According to Saudi press agency, all contestants are now checked in a designated hall where specialists look at the camel's body movements and appearance. And the animals are then scanned by X-rays and 3D ultrasound machines. Samples are also taken for genetic analysis. The event, and others like it, one has taken place in Qatar just now, remain an important connection to the Arab Peninsula heritage. Camels, dubbed by some the ships of the desert, have played a crucial role in local life for hundreds of years. They were a mode of transportation for both civilian and military purposes as well as sources of meat, milk and entertainment. Some sources suggest the first camel races took place in the 7th century. This continue to this day, often as parts of the camel festivals, as the beauty pageants are indeed only a part of the event. Camels aren't the only animals used for heritage and identity building. Falconry occupies a similar space in national culture. Falconry is used to create a particularist national identity and localness associated with Arabness, Bedouinness and masculinity. In contrast with other globalized sports, such as football, insanely popular here nonetheless, the Persian Gulf falconry is closely associated with ethnicity. Through expressions such as Arab falconry, the phenomenon is portrayed as an inanely local sport heritage, an identity marker, which gives it not only an ethnic and national boundary, but also class and territorial frontiers. The territorial, for example, includes legal regulation, such as a ban on hunting for particular animals due to environmental concerns. We could even observe geopolitics of falconry, or the way local state elites behave in the sports context when relating to the outside world. Travels associated with falconry hunting to go after the girl's traditional hunt, the Hubara Bastard, is banned in the region, a chance to make diplomas. Immediately money is spent on local infrastructure, such as schools, mosques and roads in Pakistan and Africa, in exchange for hunting permits. It stems from how elite the sport is, which I'll cover in a minute. Zayed bin Sultan, the UAE's founding father, is of a cool status. Domestically, he is portrayed as a model of masculinity, the statesman and the visionary. This is strictly associated with falconry, his sport of choice, based on his life. The state aims to promote falconry as a fundamental part of its identity. For example, opening a falcon hospital in Abu Zabi, or seeking to designate the sport as a UNESCO non-material cultural heritage. There's even a program for releasing falcons back into the wilderness, of which Zaid is a namesake. They can't be caught free nowadays, as falconers must breed them in captivity and then keep them in special facilities. The sport is presented as a sphere of true manliness. These women have a limited presence in that world. The reasoning is that 
physical demands of hunting in the wilderness of the desert prevent women from participating in, that, in the activities. Some also argue that since women haven't historically taken part in the falconry, there is little reason to change the status quo. Women have become more visible in recent years, for example as artists on festivals, but are still rather on the sidelines. The feeling of oldness only adds to that. First part of that equation is of course the cost. And breeding and maintaining a falcon is really expensive. Of course of that I mean, it remains available mostly for the rich and the influential. Prices for a single falcon begin at eight, about 8,000 dirhams or $2,000, but can go into thousands of dollars or more. This October, a falcon was sold for about $207,000 at a hunting exhibition in Abu Dhabi, the most expensive in the annual event's history. They also require intensive maintenance, and some falconers go as far as employ a full-time caretaker for every bird they have. The cost of traveling, including an airline's fee, make the sport even more prohibitive. In context of a nationalist discourse, Emiratis speak regularly of our forefathers and our pride of their accomplishments for the fatherland. Such statements don't single out any particular group of foreigners, yet at the same time they don't exactly define who is us. Despite that, referencing their own ancestors, the Emiratis underscore their license to the exclusive club of being an Emirati. Tribes still count in the region, also how long a tribe operates in a given space slash territory. From this stem some voices that Arabs from other countries who obtained Emirati citizenship aren't truly Emirati. By underlining such localness, as well as the privileges that, that the passport brings, such as free schools and privileged access to the labor market, and the migrants' feelings of belonging are extinguished. That happens despite, or because of, the fact that immigrants constitute 90% of the UAE population, giving Emiratis of old lineage material feeling of dread or losing their local culture. Other countries of the Gulf also have sizable migrant communities, although not always to such an extent. Only in Qatar it's also 90%, in Saudi Arabia it's about 30%, and in Bahrain more or less a half. That's it for today. Thank you for watching.